Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us, albeit virtually. My name is Justin Jakeley, and I'm curator of the Architecture on Film season and program for the London-based Architecture Foundation in collaboration and partnership with the Barbican. Tonight, you're about to watch a screen talk in association with our presentation of The Proposal, a film by the American artist Jill Maggot that we've been very excited about for and in conversations about bringing to London the Barbican and Architecture on Film for for almost two years now, following the film's premiere at Tribeca Film Festival in 2018. We're delighted to finally be able to bring the film to you, and which is available via Barbican Cinema On Demand for another week until the morning of Thursday, the 27th of August. Tonight's conversation will be hosted by Inez Wiseman. Inez Weissman is an architectural theorist. She's head of PhD in the School of Architecture at the Royal College of Art, director of the Bauhaus Institute for the History and Theory of Architecture and Planning in Weimar, and founding director of the Center for Documentary Architecture. Inez has worked extensively on ideas around copyright, the idea of the copy and reproduction in architecture, investigating archives, documentation, and their ethical, political, legal, and creative ramifications. And we were delighted that she was able to bring her insights to tonight's conversation. As you will see, many of these themes connect deeply with the film, The Proposal. Inyash has also written an essay entitled The Three Lives of Louis Barragan, which we commissioned from her to act as virtual program notes for our screening and presentation of the proposal. That essay can be found on the Architecture Foundation or Barbican websites. And Inyash is also one, finally, of several contributors to a book detailing and expanding upon Jill Majid's multi-year investigation of the Barragan archives, which is also called The Proposal, available from Sternberg Press now. So, Inyash will be in conversation with the director of the proposal, Jill Maggot. Jill is an American visual artist and writer whose work investigates societal power structures and questions of access and visibility. The proposal forms part of Jill's expansive investigation into the Barragan archives, exploring the narrative and legal limits of the legacy of one of the 20th century's greatest modernist architects, the Mexican Luis Barragan. That project was begun in 2013 and has been realized through all kinds of different chapters and tentacles, including exhibitions, performances, objects, a book, and with the proposal, now a feature film as well. Some of you in London may have seen uh, an installment of this, a chapter of this project at the South London Gallery in 2014, entitled Carl Quartet, a performance and installation. The film, The Proposal, is a truly fascinating object, part documentary, part extended filmed performance, and part artwork in and of itself. And we're very delighted to be able to mount this conversation and looking forward to hearing Jill and Inyesh in conversation around it and its themes and resonances. You're welcome to contribute questions to the conversation um, via commenting on the Facebook or YouTube stream, stream. But without further ado, I would like to pass over to Inez Wiseman and Jill Maggot and thank them both so deeply for their time and joining us from different sides of the Atlantic. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Justin, and uh, <laughs> hello, Jill. <laughs> uh, we have you in New York. I'm in London, and uh, uh, hello, dear audience. Uh, it's another setting for the otherwise uh, really fascinating talks we uh, sometimes have at the Barbican. <laughs> there are usually some armchairs on the stage and it's quite cozy actually to talk uh, before the film or usually more after together with the audience today. Uh, it has to be a bit of a different format <laughs> and uh, uh, but I'm really uh, uh, taking this big pleasure <laughs> uh, to uh, speak to Jill. Um, I have actually followed uh, your work, obviously, it's fascinating work and your really um, wonderful teasing out of the uh, problems around the archive of uh, Louis Barragan. Uh, but before we maybe speak specifically about the film, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about how that work on uh, on the archive for, uh, of the architect actually sits within your other inquiries, your mm -hmm. multimedia uh, works, you, you write, and uh, this one will, uh, this, the proposal is actually a film. So how does it sit within your other work? Yes. Um, hi, Ines. It's so nice to be in conversation with you. Um, I think you're asking the question more of the medium of the film. Um, but just to say a little bit also about um, the content that I've been thinking about artistic legacy for 
a really long time and what's the relationship between the artist's body, their physical body and the body of work and um, made an earlier piece about that that was a sculpture um, called the Auto Portrait Pending in which um, I'll be a diamond when I die. Um, and um, thinking about access and control and power has been a thorough uh, a, a thread through all of my work um, with systems and usually I was interested in the relationship of individual agency and government institutions and this project was the first time while it also included law and and federal governments in some way. It was mostly about private corporations and power, um, which was a new interesting space for me. And in terms of film, um, I have always been really interested in working in cinema because a lot of my projects have a strong narrative um, arc or not a strict narrative arc, but there's a narrative mm -hmm. within them. And I write books, um, about four of them I've written following the trajectory of my projects. And I always kind of saw them also like film. And so this one with the Barragan archives, I was, kind of deep into the project and was um, working on something for the Whitney Museum for Laura Poitras for her retrospect or her mid-career survey rather. And she asked me what I was working on and I explained what was happening with the Barragun archives leading up to this um, now film. And she said, are you filming this? And I said, no, I'm just documenting it, but I'm not filming it. And she said, well, write me a proposal, um, which is not the name of the film. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> and um, I did, and it kind of got approved right away as a short and then grew into the feature as I was making the work. Um, so it was really, really exciting to have this opportunity to work. Um, with film and to really think through that medium and not to just document an artwork, but to make a film in its own right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would like to come back to the, the actual filmmaking and uh, being, let's say, with architecture through film. Uh, but uh, also I think in terms of your methodology or your kind of, let's say, long uh, engagement also. I mean, the kind of work with systems of power means also that you don't quite understand them in the first place, right? So you actually need to entangle yourself with them. You kind of, uh, you you tease them out slowly uh, through various media and projects. But so can you say something, let's say, also about, let's say, your work and kind of parallelness of different themes that might kind of uh, come together at some point. Yes, I um, just like you're saying, you know, I will become interested in a system and then sort of um, get down to like, what is the heart of the question that I have? You know, and part of the project is about getting to the question, you know, so for instance, with um, the Berrigan archives, when I um, first saw Berrigan's work and was surprised that I didn't really know it when, even though I'm an artist, I went through the architecture school of my undergrad and grad and I was surprised that I wasn't familiar with his work. And then when I learned about um, the different control of his archive, you know, with the personal archive and the professional archive that I get into with the film and that once um, an archive is owned, in this case by a corporation, that there were all these um, legal restrictions that could be implemented to control how that work was shown or represented. And really my first questions were, Like, what does it mean when restrictions like this are imposed on an artist or an architect's work? Like, how did they become visible? How does a legacy grow? Who can participate in it? And so those questions, you know, are really conceptual. So then it's like, well, how do I find answers, right? And a lot of it is testing it. So um, what is not in the film as much, you'll see fragments of it, is my first couple of shows um, that were called Woman with Sombrero. And with those questions, it was like, okay, if I can't show, let's say, a photograph of Barragon's work, because um, the 
the architecture is owned through the photograph, the image rights. How can I represent that image in a way that almost infringes on copyright, but like if it went to court, I would probably win. You know, so mm -hmm. how do you play with that boundary? And that led to a series of sculptures of like, um, you know, basically you'll see in the film too, but I couldn't reproduce a photograph. But if a photograph was already in a publication, in a book, I could use the book. So the objecthood of the book allowed me to represent something I wouldn't otherwise be able to represent. So I framed the book itself mm -hmm. and it becomes this sculptural element. So, so it, there's a, there's a hand in hand thing of like, what's the question and how can I explore it formally through materials? Mm -hmm. And then that just keeps going um, in a way and grows into this kind of new system, I guess mm -hmm. you would say. Okay, I mean we have uh, like the uh, the problem somehow that we <laughs> we don't want to spoil uh, the story of the actual proposal uh, that is the film uh, for those who haven't seen the film yet. And I guess uh, uh, some uh, uh, viewers have already seen it, so we we kind of we're gonna be not so specific about the actual fact. But um, the problem is that uh, what you just described that you could not uh, actually film in the house of Louis Barrigan. Um, but you actually, you did that. The, the, the film yeah. begins with the first infringement of uh, <laughs> what you're not allowed to do. Uh, yeah. how, how did you, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the story of the house is uh, uh, really beautifully approached by you, no? So you're kind of also indulging in the imagery of actually almost of it, like overdoing the kind of, um, photographing it, documenting it, but also becoming familiar with it. And maybe you can describe a, a little bit this process of how you how you came into this, uh, this uh, the house. Uh, also because at the very beginning, there's the story of Frederica who had been in the house and yeah. who seemed to be completely uh, taken by it. And uh, you obviously, you have to, the role also of this kind of, Re, <laughs> restaging her in some ways. Um, but what were your feelings uh, knowing her experience, but also finding your own authentic experience of the building? Yeah, that's a great question. I like the idea of restaging, and I think that's very mm. new to point that out. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my first experience with the house, I didn't even know who Federica was. I didn't know okay. her story. So I went into the house and had perhaps a similar experience, um, at least how it was told to me through Juan, who's, who's in the film, of this kind of being overwhelmed with the architecture. So that is really similar what happened to me. I went to see his house and um, the house itself is quite narrative. If anyone has been in there in Barragon, really, um, He, he kind of leads you through these smaller and larger spaces with shadows and light. And um, my first feeling when I went in is, God, I really want to write here. Um, it's such an amazing place to write and be slow and um, spend spend time with. And I know that's a bit of a cliche of Barragon's work, but it's one of those times where the cliche is there because it's pretty true, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was really, really taken by um, his architecture and wanting to write in there. And then, um, you know, and in a way I was like, oh, I, well, even though I love his, love this work and love being in this house, I'm not going to make a project on it because, you know, what is my role? I'm usually an artist who's interested in power and individual agency and relationship to it. And then when I learned, um, the control over the image rights of the house, I approached it, you know, with that in mind of these questions, not only my love of Barragon's work, but how Barragon is this amazing example of what happens when um, there's this proprietary control mm -hmm. over his work. So um, what you say about filming it, yes, there was always this idea of how to navigate within the legal constraints of how to represent. Um, and also like 
I didn't want to make a film that was like a documentary about Barragan's architecture. I think that there's other people who could do that better from a more academic approach. Mm -hmm. And my artwork is really not about that. It's mm -hmm. um, more of the feeling of his spaces. So when I finally got the opportunity to live in his house, I was writing the whole time, which appears as some of the voiceover mm -hmm. in the film in living there. But you're right that I, 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 like Federica, I entered and it was like my absorbing of it and the filming was very close and I'm often filmed from behind. I wanted that feeling that you as the viewer were also entering this space, but you also have the feeling of the ghost of Barragon. Mm -hmm. you, know, it, um, you can't, not only can you not represent his work, he's also not there. So he built this house around him with his body and his height and his movement so ingrained in the very um, making of the house that being in it and filming myself and writing me into the space was another way of exploring his architecture and vision from a very intimate point of view. And I think the way Barragon is often photograph was from this bird's eye view, you know, this kind of all encompassing. And it was important to me and my cinematographer, Jared Alterman, that we we had a more intimate um, relationship with his his work and that ghost-like feeling of inhabitants. Mm -hmm. It's also beautiful when you say you write yourself into the story. How, how far do you think you wrote yourself also into the story of the archive? I mean, can... Yeah. <laughs> Can somebody tell the story of the archive without your work? Uh, I mean, without I, your, I'm uh, sure that fighting they will. for it. <laughs> I'm sure they will, and that's fine. I mean, what my whole, you know, feeling is with Barragon's work and everyone's work is that the more stories that are told about it from the wider points of view, the richer the discourse is. So there is certainly a lot of room to write about Barragon's architecture without me um and and i obviously embrace that i think that um i was trying to or am always trying to open up the door so that th there there isn't like an either or it's one academic story and and nothing else like i think the stories and the points of view and the ways of representing an artist's work you know some will rise and some will fall and it will change over time but there has to be room for that and i think a lot of times it's forgotten that barragon you know he called himself an artist as well and um at least as myself as an artist i can't imagine a more um, beautiful legacy than other artists engaging in my work and responding to my work in their way of um, of understanding it, whether it's right or wrong, you know. So I just think there should be room for that, and it doesn't mean there's not room for for another mm -hmm. representation. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you have one advantage over, let's say, the owner of the professional archive uh, is that you actually could see the personal archive. You have uh, been in that the actual personal space. You could inhabit it. You could be very personal with that space. You could be curious. You could uh, do your toenails. <laughs> it was a beautiful yeah. scene. <laughs> um, but uh, there's uh, there are also these mysterious uh, um, uh, film footages you found uh, on uh, Barragan on horse riding. But how? Where would you see? Also, the limit or the kind of the yeah the uh, the transition from a personal archive to uh, an, uh, a professional one, or yeah. kind of is there something uh, where you would feel no, there is actually something professional or like the story of the architect also in those uh, yeah findings so in kind of uh, in the personal. Yeah, archive. I think that's a really great question, and I read a lot of works um, by other artists and researchers and academics that were coming at Barragon from very different angles. A lot of things about, you know, questions of his sexual orientation and things like that. And those were spaces I didn't, um, I just didn't think for, for the questions I had that that was necessarily my space to go into, but I've read some beautiful um, questions around that and essays around it. But um, for me, what happened is because I kept 
not getting access to the professional archive. And the question was, well, like, okay, maybe I could get him to know him as a man and mm -hmm. eventually get to know him as an architect. And I certainly don't think there's a hard line between um, a person and a person's work, although there are differences, you know, there's certainly things that I do in my own artwork that I wouldn't necessarily just like do with my kids or something. Mm -hmm. You know, there's these lines, but it's kind of hard to, to always disentangle them because it's about your worldview and your approach towards life and work. Um, and especially, I think, if you're an architect and you're building like Casa Baragon was his house around himself, but it's also like a monumental piece of his architecture. So I was very fortunate to get access to his personal archive. And my first couple years of work with um, asking these questions in relationship to Bergon, I was only drawing from the personal archive. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, I had this, I got this beautiful um, Super 8 footage of him, mm -hmm. these horse tracks and him on horses and these beautiful women that he surrounded himself with. And um, one thing I think what I would say is really interesting of the experience was the more I got to know Baragon by being in his space and sleeping in his house, there was like this movement where I felt at first I was getting to know him and then I felt even farther away, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's just a very human thing of like, what does it mean to have the complete archive of someone? You know, you were, people are taking things from that archive all the time. There's like self-censorship, there's censorship from outside of that. There's ways archives are organized. So you're always just getting glimpses of, of a person and also of their work. So um, I think I was playing with that in ways and like the love triangle between me, Federica and Baragon, that was all a posthumous creation, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and it was a way of trying to understand the status of the archive and the control of it in a way that um, kind of threw everything up in the air so we could look freshly or I could look freshly, let's say, mm -hmm. that situation. Yeah. I mean, also uh, your work or your uh, uh, yeah, critique of the handling of the archive of the yeah, let's say eventual uh, privatization of uh, of an archive. Uh, it also is part of a whole story of other uh, archives, uh, uh, not only of architects, but uh, artists and uh, also uh, literature, um, where we see actually that uh, something which I called uh, um, the, the three lives of modernism, because it kind of gave me a, a sort of a structure to understand actually uh, the uh, the biological life of an author uh, in relation to the lifespan, uh, which is usually 70 or 75 years after the death of the author, which I called the second uh, life, um, and the third life uh, in which actually that uh, uh, copyright that's privatized, uh, let's say, uh, or the right of the of the author is becoming public domain. So um, for me, it was the work of uh, Adolf Loos. Uh, actually, I started uh, to realize about the kind of the complications of copyright and uh, that second life in which actually trustees, uh, friends and family members were actually involved in making the uh, the archive or the, even the biography of the architect um, distorted <laughs> mm -hmm. to actually uh, by not allowing a full access, for hiding it <laughs> or uh, uh, for people having uh, not a full uh, account of all the documents that belong to it, uh, we actually have a completely different experience or kind of also, uh, let's say, reading of the role of that uh, figure. Um, so, uh, let's say in, at large, <laughs> how do you experience also that kind of uh, problem of the second life, yeah, um, also for your own work or in, uh, in relation to artistic work at all? Yeah, I mean, I think the way you've organized that first, second and third life um, in your essays are 
it is really helpful to think about that um, because you, you talk about the first life as the life the artist is alive in producing the work. And that's where the artist can, you know, have the most control, right, of their work. But even that, once you put mm-hmm. artwork out in the world, you lose control of it. That's mm-hmm. another thing that I wanted to talk about in the film is that you can only make what you make and be responsible for that. And once it's out in the world, it has this new life that you, I think you have to accept, right? You know, um, but then this second life, as you were saying, that that's where the controversies happen right is that this is the moment that those in control or in somewhat control really map out like try to shape that legacy Mm -hmm. before Mm -hmm. it goes out into the world and where um i think i was just so naive before this project of like how legacies are formed you know i just had this idea that if someone was a great artist or a great writer a great architect they would definitely have a great legacy, but we've all learned that, you know, it depends how it's cared for and at what time things roll out. And so I I, I think being an archivist um, is, is probably an extremely challenging job and you're in charge of this life, you know, of the work and of the artist. So I never, um, I never want to say that that's not a really important thing. Um, but I also think because it's such the second life is so important that that ideally it is a time that you want to bring more people in so that 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 it can become more robust mm-hmm. at that time before it has this third life where it goes out in, into the public. Um, and your project with Loose and trying to recreate the architecture, it's especially interesting with architecture because if you if you had all the material and you rebuilt the building somewhere else, I think it would be hysterical, right? Because it, <laughs> That's the idea. <laughs> but it's like you just can't move. What is a copy, really? And does the copy do anything more than make the original an original, right? You mm-hmm. can't have an original without a copy. Um, so, so I don't know. I just embrace these things rather mm-hmm. than fear them i think yeah. um, and yeah. of course in a responsible way i'm not saying mm. throw it off yeah yeah that was also the idea that actually in the third life let's say i thought i would kind of uh, start with a copyright infringement but it was actually the third light that it lo- allows you to right. to explore a kind of a, a different uh, way of working. What is then the copy if you can actually freely copy? And actually right. it turned out that you actually learn more about the work by right. copying it because all sorts of troublesome <laughs> questions come about and uh, which is largely about how to do it, right? Yeah. And, and I think what was interesting about Baragon, um, which is probably true for many architects, is even if you have the plan, you know, there was so much, especially Baragon, the irony is that so much of his architecture he built to be photographed he was more concerned with how it photographed than anything else because he was aware of his position in Mexico and who was coming and people weren't looking there so he was making things a lot of times with the photograph in mind and so even if you go to the plan there were so many changes and alterations and stuff that it's really hard to get to like what is the source you know Mm -hmm. the original in a way Exactly, exactly. Because we have uh, one question here, I want to uh, pick it up also um, uh, as maybe one of my last questions as well. I mean, the the film, uh, the proposal is actually out since 2018, and you actually, you did film in uh, in the house. And uh, the question here from the audience is, uh, how do you protect yourself and your work from being sued? And I, maybe this relates also <laughs> whether you have, is obviously, I guess you can't protect yourself in that sense because you actually also, the, the point was to to play with it, right? To, to yeah, confront- I mean, it's a lot of things. Like um, it is a risk, of course, um, but it's a, um, it's a researched risk, uh, you know, also because I really love the law. I, I, I think the law is a, a kind of poetic structure in many ways that the, the deeper you read it and um, the legalese is you can understand the way uh, the system has built itself to protect 
Who is it protecting? Because um, copyright, it's a kind of myth that copyright was designed to protect the artist. Like we don't have time to get into that, but but it wasn't. And um, so I worked with a team of international lawyers um, because the law is different in Switzerland than it is in Mexico, than it is in the United States where we're all places we're filmed. And um, without getting too deeply into it, there were a lot of ways that the law did allow some space of representation having to be a close shot of things. Mm -hmm. um, and um, because it was a critical work, it was a documentary. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, some the, the question I see it there was also like, um, how much do you invest? I would say for this project, I had to invest quite a bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but you know, any I, I'm still open to be sued, but anyone can sue anyone. It's just whether you have a really good argument. And one last thing I would say is that most lawyers I worked with were really excited about the the questions that the film and the project raised and wanted to argue them. You know, mm -hmm. so they they wouldn't have minded. I personally don't want to be sued, but um I think that that sometimes the answers can only come up in a judgment in court. Um, and so otherwise we're just trying to understand them in different, in diff three different media, in this case, film. Of course. Jill, I think we are ending our yeah. conversation. We have to end, although there should be so much more to be discussed. But I guess also for for the audience, uh, it will be a really uh, enlightening uh, uh, piece to see your film, to rethink the work of modernist architects and uh, the relation to their archive and what we are actually seeing and what's presented to us. So thank you so much for this. Thank you, Innocent. Time. Thank you, everyone at Barbican and the Architecture Foundation. Yes. <laughs> the film. I hope so. At some point, we'll see us. <laughs> okay. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.